it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, if you're on Zoom this evening, you can post uh, any questions during the chat. Um, we're going to open up to question time about 7.15 and then from 7.30, we'll wrap things up and head inside for a book signing. And yeah, Lily and Iwana are inside. So I'm just going to introduce Leslie and then... So, Major Street's founder and director, Leslie Williams, has spent over 25 years in leadership roles at global corporations and privately owned companies, predominantly in business book publishing. She's a hands-on publisher who guides authors and their books from manuscript to bookshop shelves. So, welcome, Leslie, and welcome, Selena. Hey, so I'm here First of all, thanks for coming. Great turnout. Didn't realise there's so many numbers, so many people who aren't numbers people. I guess. <laughs> So uh, when Selena first um, talked to me about writing a book, I love the title, I Am Not a Numbers Person, because I can remember in the early stages of my publishing career, I was an editor, so I love the words and I love the books, but you know, the thought of actually having to learn the numbers was just quite terrifying, because I wasn't a numbers person. But the business I was working with at the time was my father's publisher, publishing company, and the GST was getting introduced, that's how old I am. And my dad said, I'm too old to learn all this. Uh, you've got to do this. And um, I said, but I'm not a numbers person. This is what you have to learn. And I did. And it stood me in great stead for the rest of my career. So um, that's one of the reasons why the book resonated with me. Uh, I was really excited when Selena wrote the manuscript. And I was able to read it and learn so much. And so um, I'm really happy to ask her some questions about the book now. So um, Selena, where are we? First of all, tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to the point of writing this book. Thanks, Leslie. It's funny you mentioned the GST, Carly. I don't know if you remember when we were working at Big W at Stafford and we had to go and read price of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then nights and then it turned over to yeah, GST the next day. So, yeah, that was a long night, that one. Yep. So, yeah, quite funny. Um, I guess... You know, I have a teaching background, so I taught for 16 years, and I used to joke that, you know, if I can convince 15-year-old boys that maths is important and numbers are important, then I can really convince anybody. Um, but, you know, I guess what I started to do, I worked in the UK, I started to see a really data-driven culture um, at the school in the school that I was in. And I worked out pretty quickly that while there was uses of the data that I would never want to replicate or encourage others to replicate, there was actually a lot of really good stuff in the numbers. And it, what it meant for me as a teacher was that I was able to understand my kids' learners that little bit better. I could be more targeted and specific about kind of what they needed and where their gaps were and their strengths were. And my the kids that I taught were able to then talk to me really specifically about what they needed. And so, um, yeah, I guess that was kind of the background in my intro to data, really. Um, and when I came back to Australia, I started my doctorate and worked in student data and performance roles in schools. Um, and as you know, I've published a couple of books for schools, um, you know, the, specifically in the education space. But I guess the more and more I've worked in this space of data storytelling, and I, you know, I now say I'm a data storyteller, um, the more I kind of recognise that this message is far broader than just schools. And while I work with a lot of teachers regularly that want to know how they can know their learners better, you know, I've had friends and other people that I've met along the way that are like, hey, I don't really get it either. Like, what, what, how am I meant to use the numbers that we've got? So um, the reason I actually named it I'm Not a Numbers Person is because that's actually what people say to me all the time. Um, I have people kind of, you know, friends, other people say, Selena, I get it, I get it. I know you love numbers, but I'm not a numbers person. So, um, yeah, I just kind of thought last year, let's let's give this a crack. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I actually really enjoy writing. So when I reached out to you, I was like, I'm very happy if you offer me a book contract to sit for the next couple of months and write a book because that's kind of my happy place. So, yeah. Which is exactly what you did, and we're so glad you did. Whether you write the book for the general public, not just keep all your, um, yeah. you know, all your research in the academic area. So thank you for that. Um, so tell me, what's the difference between it being data informed? Is it data or data? That's that's the first question. Well, it's a really good question. Yeah. So when I I say data now. Yeah because I changed to data when I lived in the, US, in the UK because right. that's what they say. And then I've had to kind of change back because I was in meetings and then people would be copying me and then saying data and it's just all very confusing. So I've gone back to data. <laughs> <laughs> data, 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 data. You say whatever you want. Right? <laughs> so what's the difference between being data informed and data driven? 
And why do you prefer people to be the former instead of the latter? Um, I was about to say a good question, but I wrote that question, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, it is a really important distinction. And every time I speak to whatever audience I present to or anybody that I work with, for me, it is about being data informed always and never driven by the numbers and the data. Um, I kind of use the analogy often that it's kind of like a, a horse running a race that wears blinkers. And when people are data driven, the blinkers are on. And the, the horse is just racing towards the finish line and trying to like not be distracted by all the stuff that's going on around it. But when we're data informed, the blinkers are off. And yes, we've got the goal or we're looking towards the future or whatever it might be. But at the same time, we're really cognizant of all that stuff that's happening around the outside and we're understanding the context. So in an organisation, having a KPI, for example, is useful and absolutely worth tracking and measuring along the way. But, you know, the decisions that we make based on that information and the tracking along the way needs to take into consideration what we know about the people, the teams, the context, the market, the climate, whatever it is. But all of those things that sit around the numbers are just as important um, and so when we use data to help our decision-making or to guide our decision-making, we should be informed by it, um, not driven. And, you know, that the example I used in the UK, you know, it was incredibly data-driven and it just, to be honest, people were burnt out. They were, um, you know, people were caught. I worked with people that were put on performance management processes purely because of the numbers, like brilliant operators, loved in the community, doing a great job, but literally because they hadn't hit a benchmark, they were performance managed. And, you know, when, if we want to get the best out of people, we need to really be thinking about people and teams and humans at the same time um, as thinking about the data. So I often kind of say it's about the data for me, but it's also not about the data. So it's kind of uh, holding those two things, um, you know, side by side and being okay with yep. using it to inform the decision-making rather than drive it. Good point. I like that. And I guess that's why you want people who aren't necessarily naturally numbers person to be to be able to use the numbers because they're probably better explaining it with people who are just driven by the data. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's hard. And it's uh, for me in the with all the people that I've worked with, it's really it makes sense to me that people struggle with it because you think you go to school even like in prep year one onwards, and you go to maths or you go to English, and it's kind of if you're a good math student, people often put you in the, okay, well, you're a math science, you've got a strength in that area, or you're an English humanities kind of person, and you don't often see the skills transferred across the two, and they're kind of really seen in silos. So, you know, for me, data storytelling is actually the merger of those two parts. It's the narrative and the numbers that sit side by side. Absolutely. Okay, I've got another good question for you. <laughs> um, in this te technological age, what data should we be paying attention to? Great question. <laughs> so this is a question I get asked all the time. Um, so, you know, I recently presented at a um, healthcare summit and I've, I've done some work with um, for a real estate summit that's coming up. And it's it's almost like the go-to question that people uh, ask me. And the answer is, you're actually the best person to answer that because the data that matters to you is totally related to your job, your organisation, your context. You know, even people within your organisation or different people within your organisation, they might be looking at different metrics and they mean something completely different to them. So I was working with a, a team in the US and this, there was the sales team and the marketing team. There was about 20 staff or so on each team and they didn't have access to one another's numbers. And, you know, it didn't make sense to me that, surely the sales team would benefit from knowing what's happening in marketing and vice versa but there was kind of this really siloed um split so you know the work i did with them was around well okay well what matters to you like what what do you actually want to know what's going to be useful in your work because at the end of the day we have so much data we have so much information and our job in whatever it is or whatever way we use um, data is to kind of filter down from all that noise down to like, okay, these are the couple of things or these are the few metrics that matter to me and that I'm going to act on and use. 
Um, because otherwise we just get caught up in you know the mess and the noise of all of the stuff that we could potentially do. Okay. Um so let's move on to the role of visualization in the data. And this is what I found really interesting in the book was the way you took us from the numbers through to the graphs that they can present and then the story that they can tell. So um, that the visualization is that really key part in the middle, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So like if I was to give you a spreadsheet, a massive spreadsheet just of numbers in cells, you'd be understandably really overwhelmed. Um, it's a lot of information. And it's also a lot of cognitive load. So if I'm given a spreadsheet with just a massive data dump or an I, you know, export, um, you know, a CSV file, it's potentially thousands, you know, or hundreds of thousands of data points. And so for me to try and use that information, I would have to think about what does each value mean, what does each cell mean, what do they mean side by side, what do they mean, you know, vertically. And so we can't kind of expect people to use data in that format. Um, we need to really capitalise on the power of visualisations and visualisations, you know, the old adage like um, a picture speaks a thousand words, you know, it's it's so true for data. Like you think about a crypto, like cryptocurrency, for example, the value of crypto changes by the second, literally, and the the graphs that show us the performance of crypto, you know, you could get millions of data points in a six month graph. And that's useful because you can then see the trend. So visualizations, they drop the cognitive load. So we can see the trends and the trends become more obvious. And the benefit of that, other than it being easy to read and interpret at the time, it means that we don't have people really bogged down in the analysis kind of stage of well, what does the data mean? Like what's actually happening? And it means that we can potentially fast track them to the point where they're talking about the storytelling. Like, what does this actually mean? What am I going to do about it? So it's really beneficial for both of those countries. So it's interesting in the book, though, that the way that you present it visually, it's, it's much more open to manipulation in some ways. Mm -hmm. isn't it? You can't actually argue with the numbers. But if you see a certain, like the cryptocurrency, you see a certain uptrend, mm -hmm. that's brilliant. But if you, if you zoom out and see the bigger picture, then so, yeah, and that's in the book. That's, that's interesting in how it can be painted. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same way that sometimes, you know, media organisations will handpick a statistic, you or know. Political organisations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and exactly, like, it's it's almost handpicking or cherry-picking the bit of information on the visual that will help confirm or convey the message that they're trying to um, share. So, yeah, it is certainly important to have the skill, you know, and that's part of this, you know, building more numbers people is around, you know, you don't have to be data ninjas, you don't have to be like Excel wizards, but being able to engage with it enough to ask the questions and go, hey, that access on that graph has been manipulated. Like that's actually not a fair representation of what's happening. Like that's just such a valuable skill. Brilliant. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that you see with using the data? So in organisations, I guess there's a misconception that um, it's somebody else's role. So we've kind of moved through different generations of business intelligence where data, I guess, played a role at different levels. So initially it was like the CEO, the school principal, the person at the top of the organisation would have the numbers. And it was very kind of secret squirrel business. You know, maybe there was an IT person that had access, but that was it. And we're kind of moving on this continuum along this business intelligence journey. Um, and so the kind of the next progression, progression along was where, you know, maybe small teams had access to the information, like just maybe the C-suite team or, um, you know, slightly more people, maybe some people had a data team or you had a team of analysts where you went and actually asked the, a person for a report or you were like, hey, what's happening here? Can you let me know? And then they generate a report. Um, and get it back to you. So we're actually kind of on this continuum of moving towards a data democracy and getting to this third generation of business intelligence. So, you know, for organisations, that's pretty scary, you know, opening up data and having it available to different people at different times. You know, a key concern that I hear from people is, you know, what if people misuse it? Um, what if they don't do the right things with it? Um, a common answer for me for that is, um, you know, you've got other you know, you've got other ways of, I guess, keeping track. You know, if, there's, if people do the wrong thing, you know, you've got processes that you would normally follow in that way. 
some organisations um, actually put in place like a training module where it's like a data security type training module to begin with. Um, so kind of navigating that fear is a real challenge. The other two things that really stand out, so I have a, di a data diagnostic that I run for organisations and so it's like 32 questions and I've had about 2,500 people that have done this diagnostic and the two things that consistently stand out as being the lowest factors ever across the board are that people need time to learn and they don't necessarily feel like they're supported by their organisation to build the skill. So on one hand, it's very easy to say, we want people to be more data literate, we want them to use the numbers. And then on the other hand, employees, people don't necessarily feel like they've got the time or the support to do or to build their skill. And it's like anything, like learning anything. It's not just a, you know, a one day work on this. Okay, you're sweet, you, you understand it and you'll be right to go forward. This is like, you know, for, for words people, it's like an evolution, right? Like it literally is year, you know, years on year or year on year first um, worth of a journey. Absolutely. And so moving on to the key part of the book, storytelling. Um, yeah, the numbers suddenly start having much more meaning if you can tell the story that, that you're finding the numbers. Yes, tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I often say, like, you can have the best data literacy, you can understand the numbers, you can, you know, be a statistician, um, you can have the best visualisations, you can have all the best tools in the world, you can spend a lot of money on buying the best dashboards. To be honest, none of that really means anything until you get to the final point, which is the point of data storytelling. And for me, that's kind of two key parts, um, or it kind of answers two questions. The first part of data storytelling is, like, what are the insights? Like, what's the data actually telling me? And um, there's another author that I, I read an analogy that she used, and she said it's almost like, you know, looking at oysters or looking for pearls in oysters, you know, like you've got to scan the room almost and work out, like, well, what's happening across the board and look for the pearls. And then once you've got the pearls from the oysters, it's then thinking about, okay, like the so what? So what am I doing about that now? And, you know, back to kind of what we're talking about at the beginning, this for me is about, it's about people and it's about that human element of it as well. So, you know, it's thinking about well, what does that number mean for that, for that person, for that team, or what does it mean for me in the broader context of the people that I work with and kind of the humans that I'm interacting with, um, you know, and the, the whole kind of quantitative, qualitative thing is really as well like there's a qualitative data which is often descriptive and that can give us a bit more insight into what people actually need or are thinking about um, and that can kind of be useful in a really different way to the numbers or the quantitative information. Fantastic, fabulous. Um, that's all my questions. Um, have we got questions from people here? Mm -hmm. Dr Selena. <laughs> I'm not saying Dr Selena. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really I'm actually fascinated by the uh, by the steps of storytelling uh, because you know I, I, I get the data the visualization uh, even beautiful and innovative in uh, visualizations but what is it or how difficult is it to actually create a story that's beyond just you know this is what it means to, to people or this is a snapshot of human activity yeah but how hard is it to actually create? A story, like you know, this, mm. uh, like you know, I really understand this process or this mm. this dynamic. Mm. Yeah, it's really tricky. <laughs> so I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to be honest, as I said, I think people are split into the numbers or the words people, and there's just these this almost like huge, huge kind of gap between them, and that gap hasn't always been fostered and developed. And the work that I often do with organisations, it's like just get people in the room and having a conversation about it because often you'll have the numbers people who'll be able to go, hey, I'm interested because that's really high or that's really consistent and I don't know why or, like, that's something that I'm interested in that I want to think more about. But if all they do is focus on the numbers, they're missing potentially that human element. So by having open conversations and um, dialogue with teams, it can be really powerful there's, there's kind of a challenge, I guess, in that in that you need to be able to normalise the conversation, like normalise the fact that we don't know, we don't all have the answers, we don't always know how to respond. Um, and it's also really tricky just to add to the complication that it's not a, you know, input, well, these are the inputs, this is the output. Okay, well, we'll just tweak one of the things that happened 
along the way and then we'll get a different output. Like we're working with and dealing with really complex systems and people. So it's not as simple as, okay, well, if the data shows me that, then every time I'm going to respond with this action. So, yeah, collectively, you know, for me, my next book, Leslie, we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> you know, collaborative decision-making, like evidence-informed collaborative decision-making for me is the winner because the more brains you can get looking at a data set, having that conversation, the better, I reckon. Very good. Have <laughs> got any other week's questions? <laughs> I did not read tens of thousands of words of doctoral things. Mm. Not call you doctor things. <laughs> like many of us here, I work in an educational context where I often feel like my students are quite overwhelmed by the data that just shown to them, especially in the senior phase leading towards, you know, mm. ATAR. And at the same time, I also think our students are getting quite burnt out sometimes by the repetition of a lot of Carol's work and the idea of yeah. the visible progress. Mm. What kind of other data can we find in our students that we can act, that can actually humanise the process mm. of collecting this information on them so that we can help them feel like they have a bit more control over their lives and over their destinations? Yeah. Oh, amazing question. I can't even, and I didn't even, I didn't even plan that. That was awesome. <laughs> um, I put a rush. I should have actually done that. Um, and yeah, shout out to Beck who literally read my ED over and over and over and edited it and taught me all about nominalization, uh, which we heard about today, business school. Um, yeah, look, it's in, so there's probably, I reckon, two parts to this. I think when teachers work with data with kids, it's really important to, have that conversation about this is actually not a reflection of you as a human this is just a point in time or this is where you're at in this subject and really kind of disconnect that achievement or result from who they are that's probably the first part and then I guess the other part is there is so much other information that we can show and talk to kids about so a lot of schools are doing things like the strengths and difficulties questionnaires um, they're doing well-being surveys and so being able to talk to kids not just about academic performance, but talking about them more holistically, I think is absolutely absolutely the way forward. And thanks in some ways, am I saying thanks to the pandemic, but kind of thanks to the pandemic, um, that actually is much more of a focus now. Like it's, um, yeah, I think schools have really kind of woken up to the fact that we need to actually be hearing from kids. Um, if you're not in schools and you don't work in schools, you'd probably be um, surprised to know how little student perception information, how little teachers hear from kids in a formalised way. So the more we can do that, um, I reckon the better. Anybody else? Oh, nice. Fire away. Yeah. So thank you, Selena, for an interesting discussion. Um, perhaps it follows on from the previous question. So as a, as a maths educator, educator, are we teaching data? And possibly statistics well in high school. Because when I look at the general maths or specialist maths, there's not, not a great deal of stats and data in it. No. That, that, that's at the level of the early. Yeah, so there's a little bit more in some of the senior maths than there used to be, which is good. Um, but it still very much is mathematically focused. So unless you, you know, as you know, unless you get to those complex familiar questions where you're asking them to interpret the graph. It is very kind of functional and foundational in terms of the data literacy and the visualisation. But as I said, like, for me, it's the three parts. It's the literacy, the visualisation, the storytelling. Maths does not really engage in the storytelling um, often enough. So, yeah, there's a gap, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're asking people in organisations to do this, and yet we're kind of not setting kids up for success necessarily. Um, um, thank you so much. Um, I suppose, but um, I'm not sure like how to phrase this, but what would be your tips if you are facing a situation where you've been learning about data and you understand it, you understand the data storytelling, but um, perhaps like your management or your leadership are not necessarily, they might talk the talk, but they're not actually, you know, um, really engaging in those those storytelling conversations yeah that's a really hard one um and I was in a role a few years ago where I felt like I was almost leading up and down like I was kind of I had my team and my sphere of influence but I was working with people who kind of said we want you to go into a, a data role but they had no idea of what they actually wanted that to look like so kind of through the role I was kind of navigating their expectations and what they wanted versus kind of my team and building capacity 
you know, for me, I think it's really, well, I know that it's really hard to change people's mindsets around this and to value the numbers if they're not numbers people and they're really kind of anti-data, which there are a few um, people like that around. Hopefully nobody here. Um, there's been no, like, heckling or anything, so I'm assuming that. <laughs> I mean, you're all kind of semi-numbers people. <laughs> um, but, yeah, not yet. Um, there's still time, I to think. Um, it's very much about celebrating and recognizing the good stuff. So, you know, people often look at data from a real deficit model um, and think about it as a negative or fear it. So, you know, if you're think about like if you're really fearful of it and you don't understand it, and then if people are coming to you just constantly reaffirming like a negative message, I get why they're not then open to changing their mind or seeing it in a different light. Um, but, you know, maybe looking at things like well, what are those areas of celebration or things that have gone really well and recognising that, having that conversation with them and trying to open up a bit of a kind of bridge or a pathway in that way. Um, because there's so much gold in data. Like there's, there is just as much information there that warrants celebration and recognition as there is like looking for deficits. And, you know, I think we just all sometimes fall into that. Okay, well, there's a gap, we need to fix it. But there's the whole flip side of that as well. One thing we haven't covered, which is um, one of the brilliant things that data gives us, it helps with our decision making, mm -hmm. and that is such a plus. That we don't really have yeah, absolutely, and it, it helps minimise risk. You know, it's um, when people, you know, boards, members of boards now are increasingly held personally liable um, if things go wrong, and it's like, well, you you can't anymore say oh I didn't know about that or I didn't understand it like you can't have your head in the sand and just let all the data wash over you like it's it really is important that everybody understands at least at that kind of functional level where you can engage and understand it and ask some good questions um but that's kind of a minimum right now. Any other questions? Can I just say um rather than a question then thank you for saying so what mm -hmm. um coming from a background previously where I've been in AI roles where producing data mm. uh, into something that tells a story. Mm. Big question is so what? Yeah. So often mm. since that time, presented with graphs saying it's going up or it's going down. Yep. So what? Yeah. The, 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 the problem with business so often is what, <coughs> what can be measured is yep. what will be managed. Yeah. And it doesn't tell a story. Yeah. And that, is, that question is so important. Mm. So what? Yeah. Does it actually tell a story? Is it just an opportunity? Thumb down on somebody yeah. and say well, you're not doing as well as you could, and that's where the decision making is short so I can mm. it's wrong, yeah, without looking at what else hasn't been made mm. by asking so what and, yeah. and telling a story holistically of what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, that's kind of why I really advocate for triangulation. So using multiple sources of data to inform your decision making because one piece of data or one data set is just one piece of data. So, you know, if I was to talk about an example I use in my book is like if I was to talk about my, the amount of money I had, my wealth, if I was just to look at my savings account, like that might be good today, but it completely ignores my mortgage or whatever, all those other expenses. So, um, it's a simplified you know, kind of example of that. But when we look at three or more data sets side by side, we can actually start to see the trends more holistically. So kind of rather than doing that, this is down, therefore this, you know, I think it kind of potentially can widen our scope and widen our understanding of what the situation is. It's not perfect. There are definitely people who use it poorly. <laughs> but, yeah, it's what we're doing, right? Like, having a conversation about it and what good practice looks like. So. Yeah, that's really fun. I do. That's <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, if we can take it a little bit broader, so I work with all the young people, I work with all the parents in schools, and the conversation I hear all the time is, um, particularly from mothers, I'm not good at maths. Yeah. And then that translates to young people, and then they're like, I'm not good at maths, and that follows on. And so, mm -hmm. so I'm just curious around, I'm not a numbers person, which mm -hmm. to me means I'm not good at maths. Yeah. Uh, it's a very similar, mm -hmm. you know, narrative. Have you got any insights of how we can change that in some way? Because I think there's huge potential for changing culture by doing that. Thanks, Dr. Janine. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's an awesome question because it is filtered down and there are so many kids that I've taught in my career that are like, oh, well, I'm just not good at math, so let's just, you know, get through this and maybe if I pass, then it's good. 
Look, I think, oh, well, in a perfect world, and this is maybe in my little utopia, I think as parents hopefully start to use more information like this in their roles, that they'll start to see the importance of it. And then those conversations might shift. But again, we need to, I think, the more we can talk about the fact that this is not just a siloed English or math skill, um, it is kind of the merger of two, the better. And to be honest, we need more good maths teachers. You know, when I graduated from uni, there was 120 PE teachers and there were four maths teachers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, the majority of our kids... are using numbers in themselves, aren't they? Yeah, they are. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and the, like, not the majority, I shouldn't say that before I throw any school leaders on the bus, um, but there are a lot of kids being taught by non-math specialist teachers and... It's oh, hard to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's all right. I was a maths trend and I was teaching PE. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm maths PE trained, so <laughs> yeah, weird, right? Um, you know, so how do you get more people into maths in the first place? And that's what, you know, I heard this really good person, Dr. Janine, she's um, doing some really good stuff getting people to STEM. So, <laughs> no, but providing opportunities for kids in schools to enjoy STEM and be celebrated in STEM. And, uh, you know, this is kind of generational change. Um, it's not something that we're going to solve with one book or in a couple of years. But, yeah, it's it's a, such an important thing that parent messaging is really strong. Can I just make a comment about that? Mm. In the, the, the term STEM mm. it is actually a silo in itself. Mm. And you used the term teams mm. a little bit earlier, and that to me is more indicative mm. because it includes the arts, yeah. mm. and it means that we're actually working together, yeah. bringing nice. all our own skills yeah. together as a group. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like some people say, steam. You know, with yeah. the arts in it, and it's true. It's sad that it's at the point where that had to be a thing that we highlighted. Um, I think it's kind of useful maybe to direct some attention, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. The more we can kind of do this cross-curricular and, you know, have it across subject areas and stuff, yeah, better. So I'm going again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. Because I want to ask about that plan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. Please, 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 Dara used the word value of that plan yep. mm -hmm. in the broader scheme of things like Selena knows my views on that plan. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know my views on that plan. <laughs> um, I actually think yeah. that this is this is where I potentially got things thrown at me. I actually love that plan. Um because for a point in time, <laughs> shaking your head, hear me out. For a point in time, <laughs> for a point in time assessment of where kids are at. I reckon it's actually, it can give you some really useful information as a teacher. So rather than knowing that a kid is a strong writer, a weak writer, kind of in the middle, it can give you some really useful information around like actually this group struggling with cohesion or they're struggling with sentence structure. So for me as a teacher, I can be more targeted when I have that kind of smaller bits of information. I absolutely don't agree with the pressure and all of that stuff that sits around it. Like that is not okay. But in terms of a standardised measure of being able to actually compare teacher judgments to a national norm, um, it's actually really kind of useful. In saying that, I think in terms of the parent perspective, you know, it is about, and there's plenty of parents who withdraw their kids from that plan, and I completely respect that decision as well. Um, kind of what I was saying earlier, like being able to have that conversation with kids and just saying, like, this is, this is not about who you are as a human. Like, this is just one point in time you know, we know that kids do a writing test and they either get a narrative or a persuasive and some kids are better at persuasive than they are narrative. And so some years they're just going to do better than if they'd been in the previous year or the, the following cohort. So I think it's about just trying to normalise that conversation with kids and just almost remove some of that fear. And, um, you know, school. the last school I taught at, we basically fed everybody in the morning before NAPLAN. Like we kind of had a bit of a... I actually had kids having a dance party one before now playing one day they were just like in the kitchen we'd fed them and they were really chilled out and that for me was actually success because it was like these guys are not really rattled like they're just you know just going and giving it a crack and you know if they have a good day they have a good day and if they don't they don't and back to the point about triangulation you know triangulating data then side by side allows you to go okay that kid really struggled that day or actually 
they've smashed it. And sometimes NAPLAN data really surprises us for the right reasons because kids, we see real potential in kids that maybe we hadn't been able to see in the classroom. So, yeah, that's me on NAPLAN. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You've mentioned coming from a UK background, but you talked about how data was not perhaps used in tutorship where you're representing, perhaps used to strip of its context. Mm. Do you think that there are any trends in Australia that you're seeing coming up in organisations you're working with that you probably, as those people within those organisations, be mindful of? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was totally data driven over there. So all year nine science students were ranked in the main corridor. So every time, so top to bottom, year nine kids top to bottom in science. Um, and every time they did a new piece of assessment, the rank order changed and they put it back up. It's pretty, it was pretty intense. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that is not okay. Is it ever going to be okay in my eyes? Um, look, the Courier Mail ranking schools for that plan performance from top to bottom is not okay. Like that's certainly something that I think everybody needs to push back on, um, you know, because generally wealthy schools in high socioeconomic areas are at the top of the list and small schools in regional and remote communities are at the lower end. And, you know, that is so much more than just a test on one day sat by a couple of kids. Um, I was going to say something else I forgot. The other thing I think it's pushing back against systems that have really unrealistic targets or who are not in this space of thinking about triangulated information or thinking about the whole person or the whole system. So um, an example of that is I was, I've been coaching a principal in regional New South Wales and she has six kids in her whole school and the department tells her that her NAPLAN goal is to get 100% of kids in the very highest well, men's but she's only got one kid during that plan. So she either gets 100% or she gets 0%. <laughs> <laughs> like, and the, the system are saying, well, you know, you should be getting 100%, so good luck with that. And she's like, if this kid's one mark off, I don't get it. And then I look, I get zero, and then it like looks like this massive plateau. <laughs> so, yeah, it's absolutely insane. So, yeah, there are things like that that I reckon there needs to be more people at state system and state level saying like let's actually remember that this is about humans and let's talk about people and not just be driven by the numbers speaking about people um i'd just like to know about you uh, i mean how did you become multi-dimensional like or more specifically like the way you, you remember you said that you know we tend to be channeled like academic kids tend to be channeled mm. to literate narrative or artistic yeah. you know visual and yet you, like here you are, hands across the ocean. So how did you break free, like you personally, how did you break free of that channel and that label? Oh, damn. Um, like, I, it's funny, because I'm a maths, I'm trained maths PE teacher, and my mum is a hardcore maths person, and my dad was a hardcore sport person. So, like, I had Broncos membership at six years old, and I had to do 20 maths questions when I got home from school every day. So it was like the whole time I had this kind of two- almost competing influences. Um, and I reckon that's got a massive part to play in it. For me, um, you know, I went into that context in the UK that was so driven by the data. And to be honest, I probably could have done my job the way it was and, and met the targets and had the conversations. But, you know, I loved, I loved teaching when I was doing it. And it was just, it was actually the transformation in the people that taught me the impact that this could have like I wouldn't be we wouldn't be having this conversation now if it wasn't for those kids actually being really interested in how they went having good conversations providing all that context for me and that was you know that kind of started for me 15 years ago and then this kind of evolution has been and my journey in this space has been as a result of them so yeah kind of forced to think about humans and people at the same time I have to just add that the book was very well written as well, so you've obviously got literary <laughs> skills <laughs> as well as your maths and your sports. So I have a, had a really good thesis set aside over there. <laughs> <laughs> I often say that my thesis was the worst journey in the world. It was horrendous, and my publishing um, experiences have been absolutely nothing like that, and I reckon I did my time <laughs> my, with my thesis. It was rough. Anybody else that's on to add? I've got a question. Awesome. So do you have any like seedlings for your next project or the next book? Too soon. <laughs> 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 Who 
course you don't. We haven't. <laughs> um, yeah, like for me, the next thing is around that evidence informed collaborative decision making. Um, you know, and I guess the more I work with data, the more I learn about confirmation biases and different biases that we all bring to interpreting and analysing the data, the more I kind of can see the value in, in multiple heads sitting down having that conversation. So, yeah, being able to get people in a room talking about data, going, hey, I noticed this, what do you notice, what could we do, kind of almost brainstorming, like what possible actions are, and then paving out a path forward together collectively, I reckon that's, that's kind of my next gem. Well, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> I'm going to get a book contract first. <laughs> right, so that might be a good place to finish up if no one's got any other questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fairsk and Leslie. That was wonderful. Can I just thank the average reader as well? I think they've been uh, fantastic to post the event. So thanks very much. Oh, Shadow. thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just thank Leslie? Words, words person, trusted, <laughs> trusted my numbers idea. And, you know, in my book, I kind of talk about the fact that it was fun. It's funny that even trying to write a book, you know, Leslie and I had a conversation about well, what else is in the field, how many have they sold, like is it financially viable? So it's kind of ironic that we had a numbers conversation in, even really before we had a Absolutely, um, before you said max yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr Fisk, and thank you, Leslie. <laughs>